I'll get us started again. My name is Warren Magnuson. I'm a professor in the political science department here at the University of Victoria. Uh, welcome to the City Talks. City Talks are organized by the Urban Studies Committee at the University of Victoria, which is an interdisciplinary committee uh, chaired this year by Ruben Rose Redwood of the Department of Geography. Uh, the idea of the City Talks is to reach out to the local community, uh, to make that connection between the university and the local community that's always supposed to be there, but isn't necessarily there. Um, and what we do is to try to choose a different theme every term. There are three lectures normally in each of the uh, uh, terms of the winter session. Uh, last term, the theme was the city and religion. Uh, and this term, the theme is the city and the security. We received some financing from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, which enables us to bring in some distinguished outside speakers, like our speaker today. We also received support from the University of Victoria itself, uh, including the participating departments and the central administration of the university, for which we're grateful. And we're using this space that actually belongs to the University of Victoria, uh, the Legacy Ground Gallery. And we're grateful for that as well. Our, I'll introduce our first speaker in the series this uh, term in, in a moment, but I wanted to look ahead a little bit. The uh, theme is the city and security. So our next talk in the series is on February 24th, which unusually is a Monday. We try to have them on Thursdays, but this one is on Monday. And our speaker is Steve Herbert, who is professor and director of the Law, Societies, and Justice program at the University of Washington, who's a geographer. And his topic is the battles in Seattle, paradoxes of social control in a seemingly progressive city. Um, so we'll find out about what that's about. And then on March 20th, there's been a change in the program. Uh, our speaker will be Adam Molnar, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Surveillance Studies Center at Queen's University in Kingston. Uh, he's still working out the title of this topic. Uh, but it will be to do with surveillance at the Olympics, the Vancouver Olympics and the Olympics at Sochi, maybe a bit about the Olympics in London as well. So that talk will come just after the Olympics in Sochi, and let's hope there won't be anything terrible happening there. Uh, but there might be. Uh, that's on March 20th. In between a couple of other events, uh, most immediately, one of the things that we've organized uh, this year, thanks to Vincent, who's here, why don't you put up your hand, uh, are the city walks, which are a complement to the city talks. And Vincent always organizes them <coughs> on a theme uh, related to the, to the theme of the talks that term. So, He's entitled it, The City Walks is Everywhere Under Surveillance. Uh, that's on February 1st. Starts at, it's between 10 and 12. And uh, you can find out more about it, if you like, if you go to Vincent's Victoria at wordpress.com. Uh, that's always fun. Then we have a couple of special talks this term. One on March 5th by Tina Liu, who's a professor in the Department of History at UBC. It's called Building Better Cities, Urban Renewal, State Power, and Democracy in 1960s Halifax and Vancouver. So obviously aimed at people my age. But historical studies for the rest of them. And then one of our talks from last term had to be postponed uh, to the spring, so it's on April 20th, uh, Valerie Amapo, the Department of Sociology at the University of Montreal, talking about religious diversity and spatial justice. 
Now, our speaker tonight, uh, we're very happy to have uh, David Mirakami Wood, who is Canada Research Chair in Surveillance Studies at Queen's University in Kingston, and is, among other things, part of a research group uh, which has a leg here in Victoria, thanks to my colleague, Dr. Colin Bennett. Uh, incredibly important project uh, that they're involved in and incredibly topical. Uh, among other things, uh, David is the founding editor of a journal called Surveillance and Society, so you can look that up. Uh, I won't take any more time by uh, recalling all his achievements. You can go on his website and find out all the stuff that he's done. He's based in Japan at the moment. Uh, and he told us that there will be a particular focus on Tokyo tonight. But I have to say that the title actually says, David, Security in the City is Everywhere Under Surveillance, Views from London, Rio de Janeiro, de Janeiro and Tokyo. So he doesn't say anything about the first two places. You can bug him during the question period. <laughs> Okay, good evening everybody. Um, yeah, as was just said, um, I think it would have been rather difficult to, and rather over ambitious to have tried to talk about all of these three cities very quickly in the time I've got. So what I'm going to do is, since I'm in Tokyo at the moment, well, not literally, but in general, I will um, talk mainly about Tokyo, and then I will try and hope that those of you who have an interest in Rio or in Brazil, in London, please ask me about how these things compare, and I'll try and talk about that in the question and ask, answer sessions. Afterwards, I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes, if I can, and no more than that, so we've got at least three quarters of an hour for discussion, um, and that will be usually much more productive than the talk. I have a lot of pictures as well, so you'll be pleased to know this is not going to be one in which I start talking about Foucault's Panopticon or anything like that. This is, uh, I can, again, answer questions on the theory of surveillance, but for those who are dreadfully disappointed by the lack of theory, uh, but this is going to be designed to be an accessible talk, um, and. That's the way I'll keep it. So what am I going to do? I'm going to talk largely about the government of urban space from a security perspective. So I'm going to talk about how cities are spatially regulated and controlled. Uh, and this hasn't been always through surveillance, uh, but I'm going to try and give you a long-term historical perspective first, in particular from Tokyo. But this is part of a, a bigger project, which I'll tell you about briefly in a minute. Uh, I'm going to particularly focus on the growth of CCTV and video surveillance in the contemporary period um, and look at Tokyo uh, and three different case studies from Tokyo as an example of this. I will focus largely on the first one, as you'll see there's a reason for this, uh, and then I'll draw some conclusions both about Tokyo but also try to think more widely about how Tokyo compares to cities that we're more familiar with uh, in this part of the world and indeed um, those in Europe that I've studied before. So I'm going to start with, um, this is the one bit of you know, like academic theory I'm going to do. It's, there's a kind of story told about the growth of surveillance in surveillance studies, but also in, in the literature more widely. And this is partly down to Foucault, but don't worry about that. Uh, but, you know, traditionally, in the pre-modern pre states, ruling societies and controlling societies was about authority. It was about the way in which the, in some cases, the person of the king or the emperor, the way their power was transferred to other people, was, was exercised on other people. So it was about uh, you know, armies and physical force and all of those things. And also about religion, spiritual power, and the fear of God or gods in various ways. Um, and the story is told that in modern societies, uh, with the decline of religion and the decline of uh, belief in the, the power of kings and the power of empires, you get a, a more rational forms of control being exercised. So you get uh, institutions of various kinds that start to exercise these forms of social control, uh, like prisons and hospitals, and even, of course, things that we don't normally think of as being about control, like welfare uh, and so on, which actually is much about making sure that people behave in certain ways as they are about providing for them. Uh, we can argue about that afterwards if you want. And then the story goes, at least in surveillance studies, that we're now moving out of this period, this modern period where uh, the states controlled or tried to exercise control of people through these kinds of mechanisms, many of which were, uh, had architectural features, and prisons themselves are very much an example of that, into a period of time when 
we're moving to a more digital age, but it's about, about informational control, about the control of us, not just as physical beings in space, but as digital people in various kinds of databases and our online activities. Uh, and this age has other kinds of features too, to do with economic changes, so that we're no longer apparently interested in uh, becoming better people through our control of our, our lives, uh, but we're, it's more about how we contribute economically or what threats we pose and how that can be changed and modulated and controlled. So that's the story that's told. And it sounds a very convincing story if you think about the history of Western civilizations in particular. But I was troubled by this a few years ago now, thinking, well, that's all very well. But like a lot of theory, this comes from Europe or North America. Does this story work in the context of the global south? Countries in Africa or South America, or in the, the global east, China, Japan, and so on. Does it work even within countries in, in that we're familiar with in different ways? What does this say you know, about different kinds of communities within North America or within Europe? So I, I started on a, a large project, which I'll briefly outline to you. And this is my project. The project was really to look at um, the way in which the story of surveillance played out in three very different global cities. I'm an urban scholar, so you know, apart from anything else, that's my rationale for looking at cities. Um, I'm not going to pretend I'm going to be there to do everything. But there is a very good reason for looking at global cities as examples. And what I mean by global cities is cities that are centrally connected into either political, economic, or cultural or other global circuits. So they may be economically central, like uh, London or Tokyo or Frankfurt even, but they may be culturally central. And many people have argued that in fact Tokyo's power derives not from its economic influence in the world, but from its cultural power. Um, you know, who doesn't know about manga now, and Japanese fashion, this kind of thing? It's become a global leader in those areas. So global cities are interesting places, but, of course, the term global cities implies that they have a particular relationship with globality and with globalization. And if this is the period of time we're now in, this period in which everything is becoming global, then global cities you know, provide a useful place where one can test theories about globalization. These are the places where the interactions caused by globalization are at their most intense. And you know, where, example, where you might be able to look at what's going on with globalization and see whether that story is actually true in various places, or how it's true in different ways. So that's the reason for doing what I'm doing. And the reasons why I chose Tokyo, Rio, and London are partly um, careful and rational and scientific, and partly because that's where I was able to do this work and I had connections already. I mean, Scientists will always tell you that they think of very, very careful, rational reasons why they do research. My research was mainly about personal reasons originally. I went to Japan because my wife was Japanese. Um, and I largely actually determined my research project originally in order to find ways to be in Japan. Uh, and the research came second. It's not any, actually, it doesn't result in any worse research. So don't let anybody tell you that's the wrong way to do it. <laughs> So what's the background of the Japanese case of Tokyo? Japan, and particularly Tokyo, has a really interesting and, uh, I wouldn't say unique system of social control and urban ordering, but it has a, you know, a system of ordering which is very different from those that we're some way, in some ways used to in the Western context. Some things superficially seem like they have something in common, and other things, are, you know, and actually are not, and they come from different roots. And some things don't look like they're in common at all, but actually do have similar roots. It's very complicated to try and work out. So you have to go back into history to look at some of the roots of these things. We'll be happy to know I won't be just talking about historical cities all night tonight, just about five minutes, just to give you some background, because it is important. So one of the ways in which urban Japan is particularly interesting, and it shares this with some of the ancient Chinese civilizations, is a way, first of all, in which family registration is really important in the control of society. So most Western countries, we're used to democracy being based on the idea of the unique and sovereign individual. Uh, and you know, this is not true of all countries exactly. But in Japan, the fundamental systems of registration and identification uh, are based not in the individual at all, but in the family. And so there are several results of this. First of all, of course, it's a very patriarchal system, and there are very gendered results and gendered reasons for this being the case. But also, it has very interesting results in terms of collective control. If you have families registered as the primary units in which, by which the government deals with people, 
then it doesn't matter so much about individual people who commit crimes. Because the way in which you stop that happening is not by punishing the individual, but by punishing the whole family. So the pressure not to commit crime comes from the effect you will have on your family from doing that, not on the personal consequences to you, fundamentally. This is actually extended in the way that Japan, Japanese justice has traditionally worked, traditionally worked and Japanese control has traditionally worked, because in the pre-modern, uh, in pre-modern Tokyo, pre-modern Japan in general, particularly in Tokyo, this was extended, this idea of collective responsibility was extended way beyond the family to actually neighborhoods and spaces within the city. So the classic system was derived from the Chinese and called the Gonin Gumi, the five family system. Uh, and the idea being that you had not only families responsible for all of their members, but actually families collectively responsible for each other. So five families would be grouped together. And if anybody committed a crime from any of those families, all of those people would be punished. So it wasn't just that your family would be affected, but everybody in your neighborhood would be affected. So the pressure to act and behave well came you know, from all around you, both in terms of your emotional relationships and your physical relationships, but also spatially more, more broadly, and in terms of your community relationships. And this is consistent across a wide you know, range of things in Japan, with collective responsibility being held very, very highly. And it doesn't just come from the Confucian tradition, which some people argue from China. It's something that has developed very particularly in the Japanese context as well. There are different roots of that. However, of course, the state is never going to trust people to behave well just by those kinds of measures, or even just by punishment and consequences. And there are several methods by which the state has tried to make sure that people behave well traditionally in Japan. Another is the, the so-called Koban system. This is the very localized system of policing. This is the modern term, the Koban system. A Koban is a little police box. Those of you who have been, have you been to Tokyo here and know Tokyo at all, or seen pictures of these? Essentially, these are like little mini police stations. Uh, usually there's two or three officers there. They're usually the older, slower officers. From, they're not the, kind of, you know, the headline detectives or anything like that. And sometimes, in, indeed, there are people you think would be find it rather difficult to fight crime uh, in looking at their physical condition. Um, but these, these, these kinds of, of police boxes have a very a multiple function. First of all, they're agents of reassurance. So you have these places scattered in all communities, and very, very, a lot of them. And secondly, they're agents of surveillance. They watch comings and goings. And not only that, they also help to carry out the family registration job. So the register that exists in the local authority is then updated every year by the officers literally going door to door and saying, have you seen any suspicious things? Have any foreigners moved into the area? And these kinds of questions traditionally. So to make sure that the Family registration is not just a document that sits in the government archives, but actually is a living and fully updated kind of way of ensuring that normal people are doing normal things in a neighborhood. And then, of course, finally, in this, in this area, there's been a great effort in what Sheldon Garren, who's a researcher, historical researcher, calls moral suasion. And it's government campaigns for people to behave better. Now, we're all used to these kind of things, but Japan has a really, really long and intense history of government good behavior campaigns. So it's not just that people are punished for doing bad, but they're consistently, in historical terms, reminded how to do good. And if you, if you go to Tokyo now, it's still very much the same. It's one of the cities in the world with the most intense public signage. You know, instructions on what to do, what not to do, how to behave here, how to behave there. Of course, many Westerners don't notice this because they can't read Japanese and they don't realize they're surrounded by constant moral instructions. Um, but believe me, they're, they're everywhere. Um, and it's not a result like it is in the West of the recent neoliberalization of space where you're getting private companies with lists of rules of what you shouldn't do in this park or this space. It's not about that. This is historically something that the state has provided for. So many people get confused by this and think it's about this you know, privately operated public spaces that we're familiar with in the West. No skateboarding, no sleeping, no eating, no anything. But it's actually a lot more long-standing than that. I'll leave that where it is. There's many things I could talk about historically, but otherwise I'll go away over time, so I won't, I won't go into that now. There's very different ideas of privacy, too, and we can come back and talk about that if anybody's interested. It does make a big difference, but we won't talk about that now. In recent times, when we get into the present day now, um, one of the things that's changed quite a lot, and I've jumped over all kinds of stuff, 
is that in the uh, early 2000s, a new government, um, well, a new mayor of Tokyo uh, was elected in the 90s, a guy called Ishihara, who was mayor for 20 years. He only stepped down a couple of years ago. He's now an MP. He was a, a maverick right-winger, a, a kind of right-wing populist who was outside of the main party system. He's mainly got, he mainly got elected because his brother was a famous actor and he had other family connections. Um, nobody expected much of him at the beginning. He's a Japanese nationalist as well. He's the main person, by the way, responsible for the current um, conflict with China. And I can talk about why that is in a minute. We'll come back to that if you want to know about that at the end. But he was a, a tough on crime populist, you know, the classic kind in many cases, and also an anti-Chinese, anti-Korean, anti-foreigner person in, in general. During his, uh, his time in government, he introduced this new system of legislation in Tokyo. It's based on this rather innocuous sounding idea of Anshin Anzen Machizuku, which means literally community safety development, in roughly. So it sounds like a nice you know, kind of way of helping people out. <coughs> what this, uh, this ordinance he introduced actually did, though, was to allow for the increasing deployment of surveillance measures across Tokyo by local authorities. This happened in about 2002, 2003 or so, uh, when this started. It coincided, and I think it was a coincidence, it wasn't actually a plan, with the National Police and the Tokyo Metropolitan Police becoming very interested in surveillance measures because of the upcoming, then upcoming, <coughs> Japan-Korea World Cup. So you had a combination of local government changes based on xenophobic populism, <coughs> combined with equally xenophobic fears about what foreign fans would do in Japan. And by the way, it was British fans they were worried about, English fans in particular. Despite being at this time a long time out of date, they still had the images of the late 1980s football hooligan, who incidentally was one of the figures evoked by the British in the 1990s for implementing video surveillance. But this was evoked as a, as a figure that, you know, all these people, these fans coming to Japan, they could all be hooligans and we'll have crazy people running around in the streets and riots and, you know, people getting drunk as if there wasn't enough of those in Japan already. Um, and as it happened in the end, of course, none of this materialised. In fact, the biggest public safety concern from the World Cup was overexcited Japanese fans celebrating as their team did far better than they expected, if you remember, from that World Cup. Um, as did the Koreans, but they were quite sure about that. So you had this, uh, you know, this, this kind of wave of pressure towards having video surveillance installed in, in Japanese cities. It was interesting that the way it was done in Tokyo was not quite how it was done in some other countries, and it tied into long-standing traditional cultural currents. So the way it was done was to give power to existing community organisations to do this. It wasn't the government that did it, fundamentally. It was an ordinance that empowered community associations and shopkeepers' associations to install CCTV systems. Now, Again, this might look like the kind of privatisation moves that we've seen across neoliberal cities in the world that you see all over the place. But I don't think it's really about that. I think it's actually about trying to revive, given Ishihara's you know, very pro-Japan, nativist populism, it's really about trying to revive traditional Japanese values as he saw them, i.e. that community responsibility. Um, and people often talk, you know, when you, when you see these systems in Japan, in, in their shop shopping areas as if they are a bit like the privatization of streets in the West. But they're not really because streets in Japan have always been private or privately run. Streets in Japan are not the site of, of the public like they are in, in the traditional Western model. Streets are leftover space. Japanese urban development is organized by neighborhoods which are constructed and the streets are just the space left over in between essentially. So you can get between neighbourhoods on these streets, but they've never been seen as the space of the public in the, in the way that we understand streets in, in the West, even if that's an exaggerated ideal anyway. So it's always been the case that neighbourhoods, whether they be residential neighbourhoods or whether they be um, shopkeepers associations, have always been responsible and made responsible for looking after those areas and also taking their own interest in doing so. Because it's, Again, if you have these rules about mutual responsibility, it's, you know, it's a strong incentive for you to make sure there aren't outsiders coming in and making trouble for you, which may result in you know, punishment or worse for your, for your neighbourhood. So basically, what this did was, was draw on very deep cultural roots, which of course are not kind of somehow natural or anything like that. There were previous generations of government initiatives 
to create a kind of a new generation of social control measures. Funded this way, I'm not going to talk about the funding too much, but you get funding provided by the city, local funding, and also funding from these associations. It's like one third, one third, one third. So you have to come up with the cash. What this means is that wealthier areas are able to do this very quickly and very effectively with high-tech systems. Poorer neighbours, like the one I live in in Tokyo, really struggle to try and do anything with this. And we'll see what this results in later. They have to use other measures. They can't do the high-tech stuff. They have to try and deploy other kinds of measures, some of which are quite superficially quite amusing. And I'll talk about some of those in a second. What I did was a series of so over several years, it was a series of um, different kinds of studies in Tokyo. So I spent, first of all, some time looking at the way the Tokyo police video surveillance systems had been implemented. And this happened in, eventually now, six areas. It's still happening. They're still putting these in in various places, starting with the uh, supposedly dangerous areas, which are red light districts. And I'm going to talk to you about one of those tonight. Um, this is an area called Kabukicho, which is the, any of you know Tokyo, know about it, it's the sort of premier red light area of Tokyo. Um, and it's also covered then six other areas that have similar nightlife um, activities going on. Ikebukuro, Roppongi, which is of course the, also the foreign playground, they call it, where the, originally all the soldiers from American bases went out at night, uh, and increasingly diplomats' uh, connections and all other kinds of people. Um, Shibuya, which is the, the, known as the place where teenagers, schoolgirls and university student age girls go out and uh, party, but also do things that are not so, frowned, not so approved of, like buying soft drugs and so on. Um, and now, uh, other areas like Ueno, near where I am, a smaller, more traditional red light area, and Kinshicho, which is a, known as the Kabukicho of the East, but is actually nothing like it. It's a tiny, seedy little area behind the station where there are so-called gaijin bars, which are basically bars where Russian and Ukrainian girls uh, do things for money. Um, and we'll come back to a little bit about what they do, because it's quite important later on, not in detail, but in, in certain areas. And I did various work on mapping this, and also looked at some very new private sector, more traditional, what we would more think of as privatization and neoliberal development in the case of a very large private development in somewhere called Rapongi Hills, which is one of the most extensive um, massive private redevelopments of an urban space in the world. And then I went back in 2009, 2013, 14, which is now, uh, with, this, with this bigger project to look at the cultural differences. And I started to look at some particular areas um, to look at the variety of video surveillance in these areas, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about tonight. So, what are the areas I'm looking at? The first one was Shinjuku. Shinjuku, you'll have heard of. I mean, this is the area which is, you know, where the Tokyo government is. It's where Shinjuku Station is, the busiest train station in the world, uh, and also one which Tokyo University has had a mapping project in for 20 years because it, mapping it takes is a full-time job for students. Basically, but it, it's incredible. It's, it's one of the most amazingly complex systems. Uh, it contains the high-rise district of Tokyo Metropolitan Government. That's no longer, by any means, the only high-rise district in Tokyo. There are many of them. Um, and it contains a major shopping area where Isetan Department Store, which is one of the most high-end department stores you'll ever come across anywhere, uh, is, is located. And just opposite this is Kabukicho. Um, and one of the strange things about, about Tokyo, which Westerners do find a little uh, difficult to get to grips with, is just how close all these things are. It's not like the red light district is hidden away somewhere, miles away. It's right next to the government district and next to the most expensive department store in the world. Just there, you know, it's just there, across, literally across the street. Uh, this is a, technically an entertainment district, and this term by the Tokyo police as being the most dangerous place in Tokyo. Now you've got to take that with a pinch of salt, because Tokyo is one of the least dangerous cities in the world. I mean, the murder rate is well known, it's like an eighth of, 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 the, of, of Britain's, for example, and it's far less than the USA's. There is some issues with that, and I can answer questions about it, because it's not quite clear that the crime rate in Tokyo is quite as low as the government claims. There's a massive issue with underreporting, especially when it comes to sexual offences. And there's very good reasons for that in terms of traditional uh, attitudes to shame and things like that. So there's a lot of evidence, for example, that rape is massively underreported in Japan. And this matters when it comes to areas like the one I'm talking about tonight. So there may be more that the police know that they don't officially reveal about why these places are under surveillance, Though, as I'm going to say, I don't think it's for the protection of women that these measures have been put in, and I'll come back to explain about that. It's also, 
not coincidentally, one of the major Korean districts of Tokyo. Just north of Kabukicho is one of the biggest Korean communities. And if you know anything about Korean-Japanese relations, you'll understand that there is a ongoing tension between Korean residents of Tokyo and the wider community. There was a demonstration early in 2013, just before I came back to Japan, calling for the death of all Koreans or their expulsion. Not just, you know, we don't like Koreans very much, but, you know, Koreans should be put to death. There were signs. It's a very small, minor, right-wing group, but this is not just something that's consigned to history, and it's not just, you know, some, some annoying people with the sort of extreme views in a normal way. It's some very, very extreme views going on. And Shintaro Shihara, the mayor, has actually made statements in the past saying that the first thing they should do if there's a disaster, this is the former mayor, so the governor of Tokyo, is the first thing they should do is actually imprison all the Koreans so they don't riot and take over Tokyo. Uh, this was a myth that went around after the earthquake of the 1920s, that Koreans were going to riot and, 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 and you know, take over the city. And he repeated this you know, in late 1990s, after the Kobe earthquake. So there's an interesting background there which we'll come back to. What goes on in Shinjuku? Well, here's, here's what Shinjuku looks like during the daytime at least. You've got this, you know, the classic image of the, uh, of the city, but actually if you can't read those signs, which most of you can't, there's all kinds of things being advertised there from food to sexual services. And they're all layered, stacked up. It's like a vertical street. Each building is like a vertical street in this area. There's countless little uh, bars, massage parlours, gaming dens, all kinds of things. It's usually illegal, but not necessarily in some cases, or the thing that they're actually doing is not what they're advertising in various ways. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see this is a map of sexual services available from the local sexual services kind of you know, board thing, which has an, an open shop there. Uh, I should point out, by the way, before I go forward, that what goes on in these places is not technically prostitution. Prostitution is illegal in Japan. But rather like Bill Clinton, their definition of sexual relations goes everywhere except penetrative sex. So basically you can do anything except that, and it's not considered to be prostitution. So just when I say there's no prostitution, by most people's definition there's plenty of prostitution. But it's, you know, it's the Bill Clinton definition of sexual relations. So those are the, it's a map of all their multiple sexual services complexes, which you can get a little nice handheld version in, in various areas, and you can go around and do this. Um, and they, you know, they have an industry trade association. It's, you know, it's, like, it's, it's all very open. The first public open street CCTV system in Tokyo was installed in Kabukicho in 2002. This was the first site for the Tokyo Police's initiative to put in CCTV. 50 cameras strategically placed in our British terms this is nothing, but it means that the whole neighborhood, as you'll see later, is covered very well, very strategically by cameras. What was the rationality for this? Well, first of all, it was to do with a lot of media attention around various crimes that had been committed in, in Kabuki Cho, including actually one of the previous researchers. I was, came slightly concerned about this. A, a journalist who had investigated the Kabuki Cho underground and written a book on it was found uh, chopped up in the river in, in Tokyo, which did, I didn't tell my university at the time before I did my research there, but of course he was investigating mafia activities and I wasn't going to do that kind of thing. So. Um, it, you know, on any risk assessment program, he told me never to go and live in this place again. But the main focus was on not so much the traditional Japanese mafia, the Yakuza, but on Chinese gangs. So there's this combination, not just of crime per se, but of foreign crime. And the one thing you see happening again and again in these, in these uh, initiatives for CCTV is a concern with foreign crime. Now, the police publish, by the way, separate statistics on foreign crime, and they even ask Tokyo residents how concerned they are about foreign crime every year, as if foreign crime is something like murder or rape, but something separate you can identify. Um, and, of course, if they ask that question, they get an answer, yes, we're very concerned about foreign crime. So they can then say, well, it's not our fault, you know, people are concerned about foreign crime. If you didn't ask the question, they wouldn't probably express any concern about it. And, of course, most of the actual foreign crime that takes place is visa overstaying which is a crime that only foreigners can commit. <laughs> so you've got to kind of catch 22 here. So there's lots of foreign crime because, yeah, anyway. And the actual, you know, any serious crimes committed by foreigners are a tiny, tiny proportion, and actually under the percentage of numbers of foreigners in Japan. But what they're interested in here is basically triad gang activities and other kinds of gang activities in Kabukicho, because these streets are controlled by gangs. It's sometimes really true, but it's absolutely the case. But of course, they were the organizations that actually prevented crime in the past. 
And it's well known people have done research on organised crime. The last thing that organised crime agencies want is minor crime going on by average criminals in their area. They're very, very ruthless about controlling crime. Only they're allowed to commit crime. And any particular kinds. And you know, so actually in many of these places, the amount of ordinary crime going on is much lower than other places. But of course, the Tokyo government, as part of this, didn't just introduce cameras, it introduced a new crime mapping system. And now Tokyo has this incredibly sophisticated and publicly accessible, you can go onto the police website and look at this mapping system right down to the block level, to the house level of what crimes are committed where, with colours. So you get this kind of increasingly red as crimes get higher. And it makes your neighbourhood look dangerous the darker it is, which is, you know, it's less green and more red. And as an architectural critic, a friend of mine in Japan has mentioned, this makes, instead of making it, you know, you're, you're concerned about crime where it realistically is, it makes everywhere look more or less criminal. So that you've got to be worried everywhere and look over your shoulder everywhere. And this is, of course, part of the, the like, the surveillance initiative. It's not just about technologies and cameras, but about making people think that things might happen and look out and be responsible for crime. But I think there's more to it than this, of course. I mean, it's not just about the police and what they think about, about crime in the area. This is a prime development site. It's right next to the government district. And of course, let's not pretend the government officials don't use the services in Kabuki Joe. Of course they do. Um, and it's right next to this, you know, this shopping area, which is an incredibly wealthy shopping area. It's undoubtedly the case that developers have been eyeing this place for a long time. And the centre of Kabuki Cho is this place called the Coma Theatre. Which is not actually a kabuki theatre, like the name suggests. It's just a, a, a you know, theatre for various types of activities. It was often referred to as the soul of kabuki cho, uh, and this was demolished just after I did my last period of research in 2009. There was a huge issue about what was going to happen to this site, and now, of course, there is a typical, enormous, multi-use commercial development with an integral shopping and business and apartments of the usual kind that one gets in most cities around the world. The kind of bland homogenous, corporatized development that's going to go in there. And it's massive, absolutely enormous. It's going to dominate the entire area. And of course that's going to transform everything. It will change property prices. It will change uh, pressures from new residents towards the uses that go on around that space. And of course the classic kind of gentrification changes that will occur. You might be thinking, why is this person being critical of something that's going to clean up one of the worst areas of Tokyo? I'll come back to that in a minute. Again. And a new agency has been created designed to create a town management strategy for safe and multicultural, and it, multicultural, they, they, they emphasize this a lot, multicultural Kabuki-cho renaissance. Of course, the only actually extensive multiculturalism that can, is, actually exists in this area, apart from the Koreans north of the area, is largely people who are illegal migrants working in the sex industry. They're not talking about them. We'll come back to that at the end. So I, I did some first lot of work I did back in 2006 was, first of all, just literally finding out where the cameras were and what they were watching. You know, could you actually go into Kabuki Cho and not be filmed? You know, this is the classic kind of surveillance, anti-surveillance kind of thing. Can you make a path of least surveillance through Kabuki Cho? Simple answer is no. If you go into Kabuki Cho, you are under surveillance from the start, whether you walk in or whether you drive in. Um, the entrances to the area are, have these dome cameras everywhere, and at the time there were these fixed cameras in many places as well. Um, which I look like this. Um, sorry, no, go past that. See. There's the dome cameras and there's the fixed cameras. Um, I, that picture with the gorilla, by the way, pay attention to that because it's going to become reasonably important later on. It's one of the sort of landmarks. There's a various, if you know Japanese architecture and, and planning, there's all kinds of large scale, weird mascot things all over buildings in some of these areas. And this gorilla at the time, in 2006, was above the Honky Tonk Ladies Club. And it will give you a flavour of what's changing in Kabuki looking at this, this picture now. There's a fixed camera just underneath his hand there, okay. which is uh, wa watching a significant street. And you get these strange, occasionally augmented cameras with microphones as well, which exist in certain places. This was just outside the Koma Theatre, as it was. Um, and there's a few of those around in Shibuya too. I've yet to discover exactly what the police think they're doing with those. But they won't tell me, so I suspect there's, there's, a, there's an experimental purpose to those. And there's the usual kind of cameras the police have. This, of course, is quite amusing because that camera is entirely focused on the police car that's parked outside the Koban, which is <laughs> you know, not really doing anything. And that, by the way, the camera feeds from all those cameras in Kabukicho do not go to the local police at all. 
They have no knowledge of those, what's going on and what's being seen by those cameras, and they're not told by the central police who watch the cameras. Uh, in fact, they're generally disregarded completely in any kind of planning decisions about what the police will do in this area. Then you have a rather interesting system around the outside of Kabukicho, which is not part of the police internal system. And this is called the N system. It was one of the world's first number plate recognition systems that existed in the world, and introduced in the 1980s, before anybody else even be thinking about these things. And this is a, obviously an automated number plate recognition system which photographs car number plates and records them. Has infrared cameras that can do it at night or in the day. And this is really, this is really about controlling the Yakuza who drive around in their flash cars in this area. And if you cannot drive in or around Kabukicho without being recorded on these systems. Usually these ones are only on public highways coming out of Tokyo, but it's an exception for Kabukicho. So that's really about Yakuza vehicle traffic in this area, or triad traffic in this area. But interestingly, although there are 50 plus police cameras and all these, eight, and these other cameras from the, um, the end system around the place, there's actually even more public street private cameras in Kabukicho. One of the ironies of this, of course, is that many of these cameras are on properties owned by organized crime. So you've actually got organized crime with their own systems of surveillance in the same area. They're duplicating and overlapping with the police systems of surveillance. And this is actually not at all unusual. And if you want to talk to me about Rio later on, I'll give you some very interesting examples of how that works in Rio too. In fact, in many cases, the criminals are far more sophisticated in how they use surveillance than the police are, especially in Brazil, but we'll talk about that in a minute if you want. So these, there are actually over 150 private cameras in, in Kabukicho, only 50 police ones, about over 200 now, I counted recently. So there's four, three or four or five times the numbers of cameras owned by private organisations there. Not all of which are organised crime, which should be fair here. But the ones in, on the top of pachinko parlours and so on, and gaming establishments, most likely have some kind of connection to that. I got, it's the only trouble I got into in Kabukicho filming was taking pictures of somebody's private cameras that they put in a dis, kind of discreet place in an alleyway. And, had a guy with a funny perm come out and chase me. That's the, by the way, the, the way you recognise Junior Yakuza. They, have this weird, they often have this weird permed hair. Uh, anyway, but I soon persuaded him I was a clueless tourist. Did my best English from abroad thing. I was like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Did I film you? <laughs> anyway, comes in handy sometimes. And there are even cameras in the shrines. This is a a, uh, a shrine in Kabukicho. Now, why would there be cameras in a shrine? Well, this shrine is a shrine to economic good fortune, and it's where the Yakuza bosses go to pray for business success. So it's not, it's not put there by the police, but it's the shrine authorities to make sure there isn't trouble in their shrine from rival Yakuza organizations. So don't fight in here, basically, is the, is the message of this one. And those have got much more sophisticated recently. These are the old cameras, and they're much less visible now. There's signage everywhere too, and the Tokyo government does have um, policies and, you know, does have to observe policies on signage. So there's signs here that tell you that security cameras are in operation. Doesn't, like in Canada, give you any indication of who you might actually contact or numbers or anything like that. You don't have to do that in Japan. But there's also these continuous, like I said, with the moral suasion campaigns, campaigns to tell people not to do certain things. So this is actually reverse, it should be the way around, but this is an anti-soliciting notice. Okay, it's uh, saying, look, you know, you're being watched, don't solicit. And in this case, it doesn't, what it means is it's trying to condemn something called NAMPA, which is aggressive chatting up. And what this means is young men who make it a career to basically make their living off women, and aggressively pursue them for either just sex or video work or photography. Sometimes they're working for studios, you know, and I don't mean, you know, conventional nice photographic studios here, uh, or, or just for their own pleasure. And it's a really big thing. And actually, believe it or not, some women go specifically to meet these guys. It's not just that they're unwelcome. And there's people I've come across recently doing research on women who entirely like to have their relationships based on this. So there are particular areas where they know these aggressive Lampa guys are operating and they'll choose one and allow themselves to be chatted up and you know, pretend they're not really interested in it and enjoy that kind of thing. We can talk more about that later, but I'll come back to why women's sexual services are becoming really important in this uh, just at the end. This is where all the cameras are in, in Kabukicho, at least they were in 2006, it's roughly the same now. Uh, and I measured this and then I made a coverage map to see where you could be where you weren't being under surveillance. That's the map, the red. Is basically every street in Kabukicho, except for a tiny little element of the street right at the top left there, 
Um, and that is now has a camera on it, a police camera on it. So they, they worked it out pretty quick. But that was not under surveillance. So there's no way you can go here or get into Kabuki show that is not under surveillance. So this is one of the main factors, the, the development that's going on for the Shinjuku, and this was the Koma Theatre that I was mentioning. When I went back last year to do my next work, this is what the Koma Theatre looks like now. It's an enormous development site, um, really huge. It's hard to get the scale from the, where you can take photographs in this area. Uh, and this is a guy looking rather confusedly at the map of what's going to be there, um, which seems to be the general reaction. But other things have changed in Kabuki Cho since 2006 as well. Um, the kinds of cameras, which I'll come back to in a minute, but also the nature of the sexual services is already changing. And I think this has a lot to do with not just the redevelopment work, but also the, some changes, broader changes in Japanese society. So there's a lot more of this. And this is an advert for, or several adverts, for host clubs. Host clubs are places where women with money go to pay for young men to entertain them, tell them jokes, and then they buy drinks for these people and more. Um, and they basically have become incredibly widespread and popular over the last few years. And actually mo half of Kabuki Cho, at least one side of it now, is entirely dominated by host clubs. And this is a, a very Japanese phenomenon. I have never seen an area in any Western city that has services like this for heterosexual women. It's, it's a really Japanese thing. Um, and some people try and tell you this is not prostitution, there's no sex involved, it's just about confidence and whatever. There's plenty of sex involved. There's plenty of sex involved. It's expensive sex. Um, looking at some of these guys, you're kind of wondering why, but, you know. <laughs> you can pay for different kinds, very much different kinds of men, by the way. And it's, it's, you know, a lot of these, the looks of these guys are based on manga stereotypes or characters, and so you get people who look very butch, and are very kind of rough looking, or guys that look like, or guys that look very, mostly very young and very cute. So there's a kind of variance of this kind of thing, you can choose your kind of man. And the women's, the services for men have very much the same kind of thing, that tends to emphasize very young looks, in the case of the services for men. And that's another issue that, you know, is quite controversial. And there's the, the gorilla again, and the two things you'll notice from here is one is that the club has changed from being honky-tonk ladies to a host bar. So it reflects what I'm saying here about the increasing prevalence of services for women. And the second thing is that the actual camera, if you're careful here, has changed to a more sophisticated modern variety of camera. So there's a, the police are not just keeping a system here like they do in Britain and forgetting about it, where it just stops working in, anymore. They're continually updating and using these systems uh, actively. What other things have changed? Well, when I first went to Kabuki Cho in 2006, there was a lot of signs, no foreigners allowed signs. Not that I was actually interested in, in those kind of things, it didn't make me feel excluded or anything, but it was obvious that foreigners were not welcome in many of these establishments. The opposite is now true, there are many signs saying foreigners welcome. It doesn't mean you're allowed in the other ones, because they're probably being turned away anyway. Um, but, you know, a lot of foreigners welcome signs, and. The other thing is, as well, is that now openly advertising for workers with visas to come and work in this place. In this case, Filipino women for a particular Filipino fetish club, for men who like Filipino women. And by the way, there's fetish clubs at every taste. It's not just that it's all based on race, but it isn't. But that is an interesting development because largely in the past, they've really been staffed or by people who have on there on either visa overstaying or actually not there legally at all. So there's a kind of effort, if you like, I put it legal progress here, but it seems whether you consider it progress or not, it's, these things are coming out in the open more in that sense. And this may have something to do with the surveillance, and you may think that's a good thing, a good aspect of surveillance, in the sense that it's actually really been something that's targeted on illegal migration. Of course, that's, we'll see why that's bad as well in a second. I'm not going to talk so much about some of the other areas. There's, there's different areas of Tokyo where different kinds of surveillance has taken place, uh, different kinds of attitudes. Suginami, which is to the west of Tokyo, is very interesting because they actually are one of the few areas of Tokyo that has a public ordinance in favor of privacy and against surveillance. At the same time as they have surveillance cameras, but you can actually have the right to complain about them and, and get your information uh, sorted out and so on. It sets out limits of video surveillance and where it will be. There's only two places, two wards of Tokyo, which are like the boroughs of Tokyo, out of 23 that have these. So they're not uh, on, a, on a wide scale basis. 
Interestingly enough, that's from a mayor who's a, a right-wing libertarian and also a Japanese nationalist. It's not left-wing objection at all. It's very far-right objection to surveillance. The other thing that takes place in a lot of other areas without the kind of money that Shinjuku has, and again I'll just mention this because it's, it's interesting, if you don't have money to put in CCTV cameras and you're a poor ward like Arakawa where I live, what do you do? Well what Arakawa does is rely on all kinds of other traditional ways of, of encouraging community involvement to combat crime. So this area doesn't have a lot of CCTV and they're quite realistic about their ability to put CCTV and they know they can't afford it. Um, they also say they're not interested in it. Um, but what they have done is actually mobilised the community to take over um, areas of police action which have been withdrawn. We'll come back to, if you want to ask me a question about why police have been withdrawn from these areas later, including these mini, mini police cars. They're deliberately cute, by the way. There's a lot of this in Japan, but they're deliberately cute. Little mini police cars, usually driven by cute young women or by retired men, retired male police, police officers. So it's a kind of strategy for um, making policing friendly and approachable, but they're not actually real police. They can't actually do anything if there's a crime committed. They have to call in the real police. So they're kind of a, a kind of symbolic policing effort that makes people feel safer and reduces fear of crime, that's the idea. Um, they do a lot of public education work and this kind of thing, but they're painted the same way as the police, the cars, and the people wear uniforms that look like the police. Some of you are familiar with Britain will know how this has happened a lot in Britain with commu police community support offices, what they call so-called plastic police. Um, they're not, you know, they're not real police. But what does that mean? We'll come, you can ask me what real police means in a minute. But at the same time, there's also an increase in Arakawa, like there is in Shinjuku, this restructuring, spatial restructuring and transformation of the environment. And where surveillance has taken place in this previously rough working class neighbourhood of Tokyo, it's all about redevelopment. It's all about private cameras going into redeveloped areas. Um, and there's the increase in what some people call the new samurai. So these are private neighbourhoods that have blank walls so you can't see into the area. That's what samurai quarters used to have. Um, and they're protected by CCTV and alarm systems and everything else. So they're like a new kind of samurai relying on surveillance to protect their property from outsiders. <coughs> Without the swords. Um, and of course there's been a massive influence as well of Olympic bids. And bear in mind that 2020 is not the first time recently that Tokyo bid for the Olympics. It bid in 2016 and failed. And there was a lot of upgrading of security and surveillance around the time of the failed bid for the 2016 Olympics. Um, so that's then carried over into the 2020 Olympics. And I have no doubt that just like the World Cup, 2000, um, the World Cup in Korea and Japan, that there'll be a similar increase. A couple of conclusions because I'm on 45 minutes. Firstly, there's a number of conclusions one can draw from this. I didn't go into Suginami so much, but what the other two wards, apart from Shinjuku, show is there's certainly an effort to try to revive older style, more persuasive methods to try and control crime in Tokyo that don't involve surveillance per se. So the, the Suginami mayor is very keen on not being seen as somebody doing surveillance. He's against surveillance. So he wants to try and persuade people in various ways to take on responsibility for their own safety. Um, which of course brings all kinds of its own problems together with people that he's relying on for this, the volunteers, the people who have other motives like anti-foreigner motivations. Um, are they anti-Koreans? They go on patrols to watch for suspicious people. What they really mean is outsiders. And this is something that's been concerning some people in, in Tokyo. Um, I mean, Arakawa, basically, where I live, has been unable to develop any strategy that's coherent because it has no money, essentially. So it's, it's left out of these kind of things. As a result, it has very little cohesive surveillance. <coughs> but it has the second lowest crime rate in Tokyo. So what does that say? No surveillance, yet the crime rate is incredibly low. Shinjuku still has the highest crime rate in Tokyo, despite pervasive surveillance all over the place. Um, and in some ways, Shinjuku has this, developed this kind of arrogant and contemptuous attitude to other places as a result of this influx of surveillance, they are better. The police there feel they are better than other places. Their initiatives are better, they are more high-tech, and therefore they don't have to take account of those silly kind of community efforts that other people do. They don't have old people with dogs patrolling around, which Arakawa does. That's one of its main initiatives, by the way, Arakawa is what they call one-one patrols, dog patrols, for old ladies with their little Pomeranians. <laughs> uh, literally, that's what it is, you know, walking around, scaring off thieves. <laughs> um, 
which is almost quite nice. But actually, I have colleagues in Japan who think this is as bad as CCTV. They see this as an, an, uh, the, a kind of um, inf uh, uh, evidence of you know, social control, that people are prepared to do this, to take their spare time and go out and work for the state for nothing. And actually, they regard that as in some ways perhaps even worse than, than video surveillance, that people are still prepared to do that. It depends you know, what, you think, uh, what you think is worse, perhaps. The other thing about Shinjuku that's very interesting comes to do with that, that emphasis on migration that I mentioned earlier on. It is not the case that in Shinjuku the CCTV is targeted at helping those who are most vulnerable. The people who are most vulnerable in, in Shinjuku are the migrant workers, who are often there legally or illegally. They are not being helped. They are actually being targeted using CCTV. And the main, the main use of CCTV in Tokyo, in Shinjuku so far, has very much been in immigration sweeps. So assisting the police in targeting people with visa overstay, usually trafficked women in the sex industry, and not targeting them for help, but targeting them to be thrown out of Japan, essentially, um, with extreme prejudice in that sense. So, you know, there's this, a sense in which this is uh, a, a form of surveillance like most, which is about finding your other, finding the person you are most afraid of, and targeting them for removal, not for assistance or for help. And the one thing I found in common with CCTV use across the world is there is always an other. It's never really about the safety of the community itself, but it's always about the safety of the community in relation to the other. In Japan, it's the, the foreign criminal, um, whether they're actually harmless women working in the sex industry or triad gangs, they're all the same as far as you know, the, the crime statistics are concerned. In Brazil, which uh, I can talk more about in response to questions, it's the poor and the excluded, the favela residents in the, in the, the hills of, of Rio de Janeiro. And in London, it's kind of more complex, but there's been this whole debate about the, the unruly, those who are socially kind of do un socially unacceptable things, not necessarily criminals, but people who misbehave. And of course, Tony Blair famously introduced all of these legislation about trying to combat you know, non-crime crime. Crime that wasn't really crime, but was just annoying. And therefore, by making it uh, more difficult and issuing orders to people not to do something, if they broke their orders, those orders then they could be made into criminals. So you don't get you don't get prosecuted for committing a crime, but for breaking an order not to do something that's really annoying. And that's the kind of you know the creation that creates an other in itself, the antisocial person. So one of my global conclusions from this, just to finish off, I've gone slightly over time, but not too much, which is pretty good for me, is that to say that there are many differences in the intensity of surveillance in different places, even within Tokyo, and how surveillance is used and understood, but many things are similar. And this is both in Tokyo and more broadly. Prioritization is going on everywhere, and surveillance is always, almost always part of prioritization. But even when it's not prioritization, it still seems to come with a package as well. But there is a package of neoliberal privatisation that goes on, and surveillance is part of that package. Gentrification is occurring everywhere, and that also brings it together. Creating what uh, my colleague Steve Graham, my ex-colleague from Newcastle, called splintering urbanism, a fractured urban space where there's differential levels of protection and targeting, uh, which are both social and spatial. So different populations in different places are either targeted for their own protection or to stop them from targeting other people. And that's very, very true in Rio. It's very obvious there that what's happening is the wealthy demanding protection from others are also used to being under surveillance because they have their own cameras, their security guards, and everything else. They do that for their own protection. They demand that others have the same surveillance, of, for, not to protect them, but to protect the wealthy from those people. And when you get comments like nothing to hide, nothing to fear, which you often hear from wealthy, privileged people, that's the, often the reason, because they really don't have anything to hide or to fear from those things. And the assumption is that there's basically a complete lack of empathy here, with why anybody else would have anything to hide or to fear. Surely, these people can't be different from us. Then why are you trying to, well, this is why are you trying to protect yourself from them? And there's, a, I think, one of the overall things is that what we're seeing is that, along with a splintering urban structure, is that in many cases, the the richer, wealthier spaces of the city are increasingly homogenized and separated off from the others. And what you're seeing is spaces that are familiar to, to global travelers all over the world. The same kinds of places with the same kinds of services, protected from the outside and predictable. It's about removing risk and making places smooth and seamless 
not for everybody in the area, but for those who move between these spaces at a global level, primarily and slowly on down the social class system. Um, and you're really, really seeing a kind of globalization of particular kinds of spaces, not all the whole city, but particular kinds of spaces. This is one of them, by the way, this final thing in, in Tokyo called, this is Roppongi Hills at the back of it. If I didn't tell you it was Tokyo, you wouldn't know. It could be anywhere. It could be anywhere. It could be Singapore. I mean, if I told you it was an Asian, you'd probably think it was Singapore. And actually, the worst thing you can say to people in Japan is that looks like Singapore. Because it makes them think, you know, we're horrible authoritarians. Of course it's not that. But this is a space which is bland and purified, with all obstacles removed, private security patrols it. It's, nothing can happen there that is unexpected. That's the idea. The only things that can happen are buying and entertainment and those kind of things. So that's, I think, what my conclusion is so far. It's a lot more complicated than that, of course, and hopefully during the question period from now you can question me on some of those complications and ask me, of course, how this compares to Brazil and London in different ways and maybe what I've left out and what I've simplified for the purposes of this talk. Thank you very much. I'll try to be fair. Okay, so anybody has any questions, please just, uh, yeah, raise your hand, yeah. Um, Tokyo, London, Rio, why do I see North America? Uh, because at the time I didn't have um, a, a contact in a place where I could actually go easily at a university to, to, to study, say, New York or Toronto at the time. I do now. In fact, Toronto is now the fourth city in my, in my study, and I actually used, um, had a student last year doing a study of the downtown area of Toronto to do exactly this kind of work. And what they found in Toronto was very interesting because it seemed that really there that what's going on is not so much surveillance as a kind of a background level where the, you know, what he actually said was that there's an increasing use of private security throughout downtown Toronto. The police are retreating. The police, we don't have any involvement now with the police in, say, Bay Street or those areas, the commercial districts. It's all private. Um, but what he said is they have the guys with batons, but they keep them in reserve. They're there, but you can't see them. So the kind of policing has gone into a mode of reassurance and kind of like, you know, it's this kind of persuasive reassuring kind of surveillance. You know that the guard is there, but he's there for your protection. The guy with the baton or the spray or the taser, you don't see them anymore around there. But they're there. So there's a kind of change in the way that uh, both surveillance and reassurance operate in downtown Toronto in particular. Um, and we know, of course, at the same time, that policing is getting more tooled up. You know, there are police have more tools at their disposal for control now, but you actually see them less and less in those kinds of spaces because it's bad for business. You don't want to see the, the guy with the baton. And there is an increase in CCTV, but it's not necessarily very connected. And there's actually an effort to link all this up through the business improvement districts. And the big story in Toronto is the way these business improvement districts are now starting to work together to create a seamless, privately controlled uh, CCTV system. It's not necessarily the police doing it. There is a police system, but it's very small, and they tried to leave some cameras in there from the G20. If you remember, that was the big fear, but there really aren't very many of them. So a lot of it's this growing kind of uh, blurring between different private systems, which is creating not a, a state big brother, but a kind of corporate uh, attempt to control space that really should be public. And it's slowly working out from the private squares in the, in the middle of the, these, these places onto the streets. Um, and yeah, it's it's done through agreements. So the police say, well, you know, you can look after this street, and and before you know it, the police aren't there at all. Anymore. And what we've got is private private security. So that's that's what we, you know, at least one of the pieces of research has been done thinks is happening in downtown Toronto. But of course, then you're getting areas of Toronto on the outskirts that are completely excluded from any kind of protective policing at all. You know, and you don't get any kind of uh, police or private security going there. The only thing you do get, of course, is the very intrusive Ontario welfare system. And Ontario, as you may know, has the most intrusive laws about what, pe what uh, government inspectors can do to people uh, in, in order to stop them from receiving welfare. You know, for example, if you're growing plants in your back garden for food, you can actually lose your benefits. Uh, it's not because then you're doing productive work and you should be seeking paid work. If you have time to grow food, surely you have time to look for a job. Uh, and this kind of thing. So there's, they can actually come into your house and all this kind of stuff. It's the th kind of things that anybody else would not put up with at all. So there's, there's kinds of surveillance people are subjected to are very different, some of which is protective, some of which is about protecting society from them, some of which is about revenue, 
I mean, that's the thing about these surveillance is everywhere. It's not necessarily the same kind of surveillance everywhere. It's, it's, it's for very different purposes and it targets people in different ways for different reasons. whole sort of ecology between shame and honor and how things have changed. Because when you started about talking about family registration, some sort of self-governing way of thinking about honor and shame. So do you, I mean, are private domestic spaces also subject to any sort of oversight and surveillance? And you know, this transparency around the sex industry, is this something recent? And is there a sort of shame and honor sort of Okay. This requires me to start talking a bit about the Japanese sense of privacy, which I'm actually not an expert on, but I know a little bit about. And maybe Colin knows a little bit more from other sources about this. I don't know. We can discuss this. But okay, there's several things. First of all, is that what I said about this kind of control to responsibility. It's not the only thing. Okay. So you know, the Tokyo government of the of the, the Edo period, uh, Shogun, never trusted people that much, even with those kinds of forms of, of control. Pre-modern Tokyo was full of informers. And all pre-modern societies, the most pervasive form of surveillance is usually informers, uh, whatever you call them. So in, in Japan, man, this, uh, the way they were named was really interesting. There was first a set of people called um, meakashi, which means sharp eyes, people who look out. Um, they were replaced, because they were largely hated by people, by another group of people called the teisaki, means fingertips. The people who you know, reach out. Um, and these people were recruited from the criminal classes. They were recruited from people who were cr criminals who had been convicted. As part of their release, you know, they were allowed to, they were, you know, ordered to keep a watch on, on the populations. So they actually, the one of the origins of the yakuza, by the way, is in government surveillance measures in pre-modern Japan. So these were actually impa people empowered to watch others by the government, who organised themselves into criminal gangs and so on. Um, this is one of the biggest problems with responsabilising communities, of course, is you end up with basically organized crime. Uh, and it's not directly, you know, descended from the other ways in which organized crime emerges in Japan. So that's one thing. The other thing is that actually <coughs> privacy and intimacy in Japan are, I'm going to be very careful what I say here without being trying to reinforce stereotypes about this, but they are subtly different from the ways in which privacy and intimacy have at least been conceived of in the West. And I say this because we, privacy and intimacy are not exactly what we say they are in the West either all the time. We have idealization that somehow once we had a private life and now our private life is being you know, taken away by the state. Well, actually privacy, Colin can tell you, it only really existed as a concept in, from medieval Europe once certain kinds of architectural changes started to occur when the feudal, hall, the feudal band started living outside of the Lord's uh, Hall or which the hall was divided up into various ways. It's a fairly recent, in terms of human history, development in Europe. So it's not as if we have an idealized privacy situation and then if I talk about Japan it being different, then somehow this is not my, the idea or, the, or whatever. But privacy traditionally in Japan has been, I think, thought of in a more subtle series of ways. It's not like you have the, the idealized British form of privacy where the Englishman's home is his castle. You know, the state can't, cannot come into my house. And of course, that says a lot about what privacy is thought of in Britain anyway and evokes that feminist critique of privacy, which of course now is not very popular, which is very interesting. You know, it's, feminist critiques of privacy have been kind of roundly pushed down again in an era when privacy is under threat from all kinds of sources. But in Japan, the, um, the, the nature of privacy in the home is much more subtle in the sense that the home is not just a space in which there's a, a line outside and you cannot come in. There's gradations of intimacy within the house. Um, it's true, of course, in Western houses too. But very, very clearly in Japan, there are public, semi-public spaces, spaces within the house that are you know, partly familial, partly not. Some parts of the family allowed in some, not in others. And it's very, very complicated. And of course, the Japanese, this relates to, in many ways, the physical structures of homes. You can learn a lot about privacy from the physical structures of buildings. And of course, Japanese traditional buildings are made up of wood frame with translucent screens, which you can't quite see through, but let light through. And of course, it sounds through. So a lot, of, a lot of traditional privacy in Japan is based on uh, agreeing not to hear and see things. Not that you cannot hear and see things, because you can. And if you ever spend any time in a traditional Japanese house, you realize there's certain things you really don't want to do, want your father-in-law to hear, for example. You just can't do those kind of things. So, you know, you, you, you know if you do do them, if anyone does do those kind of things, you have to agree that you don't hear them. Otherwise it can be, I mean, how embarrassing can that be otherwise? 
or you go outside and do them somewhere else. And this is why the Japanese have love hotels, which you may have heard of. And why, these are one of the things that ring many of these red light areas. It's not just about buying <coughs> sexual services. It's about actually just pe ordinary people seeking privacy for their intimate activities. Because they cannot have privacy of that kind in the home. It's just not possible. Even in modern buildings, by the way, in Japan, which are incredibly badly soundproofed. Um, incredibly badly soundproofed, especially the cheap ones. I mean, yeah, I could tell you stories about that, but you can pretty much imagine what kinds of things some of my neighbours were doing. And it's not just about sex, it's also about other kinds of intimate things. People getting drunk and falling over and all kinds of stuff you don't want to hear, you know. Um, but you do. So there's that sense. So in some ways, it's a... Uh, when you talk about, is our homes under surveillance in Japan, or is there intimate surveillance in homes, actually, traditionally, you can know everything you want to know about what's going on in a house just by being in them. And the, the actual thing is about agreeing not to see in here, about what you don't see in here. So it's, about, it's not about conducting surveillance, but about choosing to withdraw from the possibility that you can know everything. And this kind of social, it requires an immensely, immense sort of sense of social responsibility and self-control. So although a lot of these systems are about, you know, you can think about them as being the state control of people, you know, trying to do this. A lot of it's about self-control, about how you live in a society which, in which you have the ability to know what everybody is doing, but you'd rather not exercise that for various reasons. And of course, that's intimate personal in relations between people, and of course that's very different from relations between the state and people. But of course, the informers, that complicates that. These are people who are the state, but then also you and your neighbours and everyone else around you. And of course, the, in East Germany, this was, in former East Germany, the Stasi, this was one of the main ways in which the state maintained control, was by you never knowing if your wife or your son or anybody else was uh, actually working for the state. Um, they had up to one-sixth of the population at one point working as informers in East Germany, in the former East Germany. So there, there's a whole very complicated thing. When you ask a question about, you know, that you get into a whole series of really different arguments, and I, I can't even do justice to that other thing. That's what you mean. And then you. Okay. Um, so you spoke about Tokyo um, and the World Cup in 2002 kind of being mm -hmm. part of the events and surveillance in Tokyo. Um, how would you compare it or even consider what the advancement of surveillance in Rio de Janeiro is going to be with the Confederations Cup last year, World Cup, and then the Olympics? Well, this is a great question. It's one of the things I was looking at. I went to Brazil for four months in 2009 doing a similar kind of research to this. And, um, okay, first of all, at that time, it seemed like Rio was really not going down the route of being a surveillance society or having extensive camera surveillance at all. It was very, very, it was not very widespread in very small areas. And I actually concluded, and it turns out inaccurately, that this wasn't going to happen. I was wrong, completely wrong about what was happening in Rio. The year after I left Rio, they installed the world's first smart city control room with money from IBM, where it has integrated connections of traffic cameras, weather reporting, the whole material physical infrastructure of the city is potentially under 24-hour instantaneous you know, observation. It's not the police, by the way. The police are building their own so-called Pentagon of Brazil, of Rio, now in Rio de Janeiro, which is going to integrate fire, ambulance, police services, and have more cameras, and so on. So not only is it having one integrated control room surveillance system, but two. Uh, and it's going to be more, that's more advanced than, as far as I know, any other city in the world right now. So it's gone from being a city which had very little video surveillance, except private surveillance, which is extensive, you know, protective private surveillance, to one that's having the most, you know, kind of advanced, at least technically advanced systems. This is, of course, about sport and mega events, partly, um, in the case of the, the police one. But the actual civilian one is a lot to do with not so much those kind of events, but a company, in this case IBM, taking advantage of the fears that people have in order to conduct essentially a social experiment, you know, an, an economic experiment, and to sell, to use this as an experimental grounds, they can sell smart city projects to other places in the world. And this is already happening. And the, Rio, the mayor of Rio de Janeiro is being used as a spokesperson for this. You may have seen his TEDx talks, uh, the mayor of Rio, on how he can control the city 24-7 from anywhere in the world. He's basically acting as a shill for IBM. He's a paid spokesman for IBM. A, a city mayor going around the world advertising. It's a smart city project, which makes him look good, of course, and makes him appear like he's some kind of techno wizard. But actually, it's, it's not really about that at all. And of course, the government in Rio, it's worth noting, is a particularly centre-right government. 
that has abandoned many of the previous social programs that were trying to help the poor residents of the favelas and has gone for control. And they've gone for this in, in a way, and I was talking in a very interesting conversation with a, another colleague who's not here tonight, unfortunately, about Medellin in Colombia and the way they try to get um, formalize informal communities, uh, introduce social programs as well as policing. Rio has taken this example, they just decided to forget about the social programs element. So the current mayor is a great fan of the Medellin policy of police pacification of offenders. And they use the term pacification. That's actually the title of the police units. Yeah. Uh, and they, by the way, I'll just tell you where they get their, their influences from. Medellin in Colombia is one of them. Sounds great. That's okay. It's a nice, progressive form of police pacification, which comes with education, free infrastructure supplies, and all those kind of things, making communities into neighborhoods, which, by the way, was the previous policy of the Rio government, which has now been got rid of. Second influence is Haiti. Yeah, but yeah, they, the international efforts to stabilize Haiti after the uh, earthquakes and so on is it one of their major, the hurricane, sorry, is one of their major inf influences, which many of you study Haiti would think, what the, yeah. Um, so they, and actually the police chief said to me, you know, we've got to start treating Rio like it's a war zone. We have to act this way. It is a war, and we should acknowledge this. He said, look, the Red Cross are in the favelas. They're only, they're only operating war zones. Who, why are we, they not pretending? They're pretending it's not a war zone. Why shouldn't we pretend it's a war zone? And they're quite open about wanting to be treated like a war zone. And this is the Special Operations Battalion of the police. So you may know in Rio, have a, a kind of, they have a reputation. They have films made about them, Tropa de Liche, the lead squad. And, you know, um, one of our colleagues actually made the CCTV control room for the second film in the Tropa de Liche series, which is when they discovered the corruption. Suddenly it's all not so great. Um, a third influence is Israel. He was not surprised to know, and if you study the international policy transfer, the Brazilians are really interested in community policing in Israel as a good example of how to do community policing. And they send their, some of their officers in the pacification units on courses in Israel on how to do community relations and policing. Which like, is one of the sickest jokes, I think, actually, given the how community policing works in Israel. It's, it's, you know, whatever you think about Israel and everything else in the arguments, there is no way that policing <coughs> of you know, occupied territories and so on is a, is, a, is a reasonable thing to copy in, in most other places. Even the Israelis would acknowledge they have this reasons why they do certain things that aren't normal. So these are the kind of examples of these, there are others, but it's basically the ways in which the uh, control is being implemented in Rio is, is on the lines of essentially some kind of occupying force, colonial force, or war zone. Uh, and so what's happening before the World Cup coming up this year, and it's going to intensify before the Olympics, which is entirely based around Rio, not just partially, is a kind of, uh, yeah, military operation. And the way that surveillance has been put in is through pacification. They're slowly clearing surveillance of the drug gangs, who are not always what we've seen, uh, reoccupying them, putting permanent police forces in, and surveillance cameras coming afterwards. They can control the areas. Um, and then you would think, and you would hope, if they're following the Medellin model, they bring in social services and schools, which doesn't seem to have quite happened yet. I'm sure it will happen in the future. I'm sure, absolutely sure that will happen. Uh, and in fact, I was told that they were just doing this as a first step, but there doesn't seem to be any effort at the moment to install these social services as yet. Um, and I think basically what might happen is as soon as these mega events are over, we'll see a, a retreat. And uh, you know, maybe the, the eyes of the world are off, and then they'll see things retreating. A lot of these, by the way, involve, in some cases, violent evictions of these communities, especially if they're in areas where they want to build facilities. And this doesn't happen much for the World Cup yet, but it won't happen for the Olympics, because all the floodplain areas, the flatter areas of Rio, are currently occupied by favelas, by poor communities. And uh, I will be very surprised that there is not widespread, massive evictions of people from these communities, which, of course, have no legal standing in Brazil. <coughs> They're in, informal, illegal settlements, and therefore they have no land rights, no property rights. Uh, and some of these evictions are already happening. Medellin, by the way, one of the key things they did when they invaded the settlements with police and bought in the services was grant land rights to people. So they were living there. It's not happening in the Brazil case, in both cases. They made it. Yes, um, quick point. <laughs> 
mean, abso absolutely. And I think, you know, I was actually involved in a court case a few years ago when I first arrived in Canada about long range acoustic devices that were bought for the use in the G8 and G20 summits, which actually the judge ruled in the game that they were allowed to have them, but they weren't allowed to use them on the highest settings that caused destruction of eardrums and things. So, um, yeah, they did. They did buy them for Vancouver too, it was revealed afterwards. There is, across the world, in cities, I would say, a, a general trend towards the militarization of police. And a lot of this has to do with equipment. Um, in the USA, it's most intense because essentially there was a, laws passed a few years ago that allowed police to acquire military equipment. And they've been absolutely tooling up. I mean, police are tooling up everywhere. Um, police, you know, some people have remarked they are unrecognizable as the kind of police one sees from old TV series. Uh, we're seeing a police that look largely like, you know, stormtroopers out of Star Wars. They're armored, they're, you know, they're carrying weapons that may be less lethal, but they're not non-lethal. And we've seen this in Canada with tasers, and we're getting mobilizing devices, all kinds of different things that police now have. So there's certainly a kind of an, a massive investment in the, in the infrastructure of policing. Uh, and as you say, in most um, industrialized or post-industrial countries, crime has already come down massively. It doesn't, it's not justified in that sense at all. Um, but they would argue it's about threats, not about crime. Not about crime itself, but about the threat of catastrophic forms of crime, terrorism, urban structure, and so on. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. They're portable. I mean, it's, um, yeah, they, they are portable, and some of them are mountable on cars. Some of them are handheld. They're basically like extremely loud, uh, powerful microphones, but directional. Uh, sorry, mic megaphones, directional megaphones, uh, and yeah, they do have damaging effects on ears, which is one of their reasons. Um, okay, there was somebody over here before we go on to other people. Yeah, there was somebody here first. I know before you were the third person. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Could you repeat the question? Hmm? Can you repeat the question? Yes, I will. Yeah, we couldn't hear. The question was that given that Shinjuku is apparently encircled by surveillance cameras and you can't be, you can't get in there without being seen. Have people worked out ways to circumvent this, especially the criminal gangs? Uh, well, they must do, because they're still in there. Um, and it's not so much they circumvent it, it's that, of course, if you know anything about organized crime, organized crime always has a relationship with the police, and it's not always about an adversarial relationship. The police are very well aware that organized crime has a certain social function. And, of course, as we know from Italy, and we know from Japan, other places where there is organized crime, that function is often involved in keeping the police's job easier in areas which they have control over significant influence in. So they often traditionally have let them control areas in return for the fact that they keep crime low, the kind of crime that they're interested in. And they'll turn a blind eye to you know, the, the prostitution, some of the trafficking issues, and the inter-yakuza um, or inter-mafia crime that happens. So if somebody gets shot from one gang, it's not really the police's concern. Um, but if somebody gets shot from outside the Yakuza, then it is. So they, it's the interest of the Yakuza not to allow the police to, uh, not, not to want the police to come in and therefore to behave in a way negotiated with the police. Now that was true up to about the 1990s. And then there was Yakuza control laws brought in, uh, which has complicated this relationship. And the police have not always been in favor of these laws or been in favor of implementing them, which basically criminalized the Yakuza. And actually, the Yakuza were not entirely a criminal organization until that point. You're allowed to be a member of a, you know, this kind of organization. You just don't allow to do certain things as a member. But membership of these organizations has now been criminalized. And the idea is that this will actually then control the, the, the organizations altogether. But what it's done is, in some ways, made some of them, the organizations more desperate and more likely to, to actually do very bad things indeed uh, as a result of this. And of course, then you've got foreign criminal organizations like the Triads who don't come under this rubric at all. And one of the the reasons why this surveillance is installed in Shinjuku is because it contains this incomprehensible criminal organization, i.e. the triads, not the Yakuza who the police know and trust, essentially. So it's about, you know, do they, do they get away with it? Well, yeah, because I mean, how do you identify somebody who's a member of a triad gang through a camera? I mean, if the police actually know that particular person is a member of a gang, yeah. But, you know, 
It doesn't mean that every, other, every Chinese person going to Kabuki shows is a member of the gang. How do you differentiate between a Chinese person and a Japanese person by sight? You know, Japanese people tell you they can tell there's a Korean and a Japanese person, but they can't. I mean, you know, the, the, the racial types across Korea, Japan, and China are actually much more about historical movements. People have nothing to do with national borders at all. Um, so people in Kyushu and Japan look more like southern Chinese people. People in northern Japan look a bit more like Korean people. So, you know, there's not on national borders. So you can't tell the difference between, you know, somebody who's Chinese. And even if you could, why, you know, how could you justifiably target a Chinese person just because they were Chinese? It's very, very difficult just with surveillance to actually make those kind of differences. So even being able to tell who's who in the first place is a problem. So it hasn't made a huge amount of difference. They would say that certain crimes have been directly prevented by CCTV. Um, there's been high profile, you know, usual kind of high profile media cases. But there's actually very little evidence when you look into them that the surveillance was actually, you know, a key part of those cases. What it enables you to do is have pictures and see things after the event. So you can get pictures, you can put in the papers of something happening or somebody being arrested and whatever. And it makes it look like CCTV is working. But sometimes what you're actually looking at, and this is of course, very famously true in the British cases. And if you remember the James Bulger case, which was one of the biggest drivers towards the increase of CCTV in Britain, when a young kid was killed by two other young kids, and what you saw on CCTV, in the, which was there in the shopping centre where he was kidnapped, was him being led away by the hand by the person who would later kill him. But actually, of course, what people fail to see when they watch this and then ask for CCTV is actually you're watching the failure of CCTV. It didn't stop that person kidnapping and killing the child. And that was what was argued when CCTV was put in in Britain. And it was what was argued in Japan the same way. CCTV would prevent crime. It doesn't. We know that now. It does not prevent crime. And, and of course, the subsidiary argument is then, well, it can help us solve crime. Um, just find them. And then, of course, if you look at the evidence for that, that's very equivocal as well. Um, certain kinds of crimes, yes. Certain kinds of crimes, no. And so the police then go back to the, it will help people, it will help reduce fear of crime. And how much are you going to pay to help reduce fear of crime? And this is the same kind of thing with the argument about tooling up the police. You know, often it comes down to that, that same thing. People will be reassured if the police have the latest technologies and tools. You want to pay how much for that? You know, surely you could just give that money to the people who are supposedly causing the crime because of their poverty, and it might actually be a much, you know, a much better and more effective way of spending public money. But that's, of course, not very popular, so. <laughs> especially amongst the electorates who currently centre-right governments are appealing to. I think I'm going to have to cut in here because we're, our time in this space is running out. And so I'd like you, all of you, to join me in thanking David Muir Pane Wood. Very much. Steve Herbert, I can absolutely thoroughly recommend him. He'll pick up a lot of things I said tonight and take them even further. Really great guys.